The Sound Off Podcast. The podcast about broadcast with Matt Kundle. Starts now. Since the beginning of time, people have talked about the weather. And that's what we're going to do today. Chris St. Clair recently retired after 26 years on Canada's Weather Network. But did you know that he was in radio before joining the Weather Network in 1994? Now, I knew that because we worked together for a few years at Chum in Montreal. And in that time, we never got together to talk about his career before he got to Montreal. And we certainly haven't spoken about what happened next. But being the weather junkie that I am and avid TV watcher, I have a rough idea. And you probably do too. Chris St. Clair joins me from his home in Kingston, Ontario. So it's 1977. You're in Halifax and you're on the air at the legendary 92 CJCH. How did that happen? Uh, it was weird. I was the luckiest teenager in Halifax in 1977, 78. We had a radio station in my high school, Halifax West, but I was like super into it. A lot of people just did it as a place to go hook off classes. But I, I had always been into radio when I was like a little tiny kid, like 1969, 1970. I remember listening to, I used to dial in the stations from New York City and I would listen to WABC and WNBC and WCBS. And I was into like the jocks, the way they did radio in the seventies was cool. And so anyway, I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be on the radio. I taped like a half an hour show at the high school radio station, the whole thing, not telescoped or anything. And I went down to um, CJCH and they just hired a new program director, David Wolf. He was young. He was probably only five years older than me. And he listened to the tape, and then he told me how to actually make a tape. He had to cut the songs out. He only wanted the intros and stuff. And so I did that. Like for two or three weeks, I would bring a tape down every Friday after school, and he'd listen to it and give me tips. And then he said, okay, come on in this weekend and learn how to run the board. And so I learned how to run the board. And after like three, four weeks, he said, okay, you can do the all-night show starting at midnight on a Saturday night. And so that's how it started. It was, it was lucky. It was great. It was cool. Where was CJCH back in those days? Where was it located in Halifax? Yeah, it was on McCara Street. So it was uh, the corner of Kara and Roby Street. They were there until they moved to uh, Gricola Street, the Pink Palace. The lineup was um, Brian Phillips was doing mornings. They had just put Greg Lee on middays. Afternoons was Randy Duell. Bill Hutchinson was filling in at nights. Steve Bolton had just left. Terry Williams had just left in the months previous to go to Hamilton and start CJJD in Hamilton. Dane McKinnon did the overnight show, and, and I did the overnight show, and then they brought in a guy called Don Rose, not the real Don Rose, but Don Rose from Woodstock, New Brunswick, to do the all-night show. And Richard Carell came in a little bit later, and uh, they moved Greg Lee to Knights and brought in Jay Donovan, came in from Kelowna to do middays, and then he left, and John Harada, people remember Harada data in every market that he worked in came in to do uh, middays after that. And I, I was there for two and a half, almost three years. It was great. Play. It was like, it was my radio college. And that's great. You and I have that in common because I got my startup in the Annapolis Valley, not far from there. And many of those names that you mentioned are ones that I remember, whether it was in the hallways of, of the radio station or in folklore, or when I would take a trip into Halifax. You worked in the Valley. I didn't know that. Yeah, I was worked up in Annapolis Valley Radio, Magic 97, which wasn't on the air until 1986. But AVR had those four sticks up and down, uh, up and down the Annapolis Valley, and uh, it was my radio college as well. Well, it's funny because like I went to school at Acadia, and my dad had a farm. He worked in Halifax. Anyway, he bought a piece of property and, and a farm in uh, Wolfville, and so I lived with my dad. So I, I would do the all night show and then drive back down to Wolfville to his farm. And CJCH, it rocked at night, but it was such a great adult contemporary station during the day. You know, Dave Wright did the talk show for two hours every morning after the morning show. Other than from 7 p.m. till 11 p.m., it was a really solid adult contemporary radio station. I was like a teenager. And I remember driving down to the valley and I would tune in AVR because you would play, you guys were playing like at night, stuff like Journey which CJCH did not play. So it was like, it was kind of cool because I thought, well, I'd like, maybe I should go work in the Valley because the tunes are better. What'd you study at Acadia? I was going to be a teacher. Acadia cranks out so many teachers. They're, they're well known for that. I went to Acadia as well. So you and I have that in common too. Oh, look at that. I don't want to, you know, downplay because it's a great school. My sister actually teaches music there now. 
but it was where you went if you couldn't get into like Dow or St. Mary's, or if you just wanted to get out of Halifax. It was a great school to go to. And I mean, Wolfville is a great little town, a great little university town. I love it. What did you study there? Well, I was only there for a year. So I did some English, but radio kind of, I said, I think I spent the time I was supposed to be spending studying as a percentage, less than 50% on that, because I think that the radio thing kind of ate me. Yeah, but I had the same problem as well. I'd spend too much time at the campus station and over in Kentville at the radio station and just enough time to squeeze out a bachelor's degree in the end. Well, let's see, you got a bachelor's degree out of it. <laughs> so what did you do, you know, in the 1980s? Sort of a crazy question. Hey, can you put the 1980s in a capsule for me on the radio side of things? Well, I, I, because you see, when I was working at, at CJCH, I was in over my head as far as being on it. I mean, all nights was all I was going to get there. I remember when Terry Williams hired me, because I, I did work for Terry Williams. He hired me in Kingston. And he always, he said to me, it takes 10 years to get good in this business. And it, I thought, oh, wow, I got three under my belt, so it should be seven more. Those are the truest words ever spoken, that it takes 10 years to kind of get your chops. I, mean, I, I worked, I did everything at CJC. I, did, I carded all the music. I opted the talk show. I did all nights on the weekend I did, and drove the summer cruiser. And finally, I, I realized that if I wanted to get good on the air, I was going to have to dedicate myself to being on the air. So I started applying, sending out tapes, and I sent them all over the place in the Maritimes. But I knew in my heart of hearts, I wanted to work in Toronto. Like, I mean, that's where everybody wanted to work. So I started sending tapes to places, radio stations in, in Ontario. And I got an offer in, at CFCY in Charlottetown. And at times, I wish I had taken it because I always wanted to work at CFCY because it was a great summer radio station. But anyway, I wound up at CHOK in Sarnia, which was kind of an adult contemporary station. It was 1070. And I went there in September of 1980 to do the all night show. And they played like adult contemporary during the day, except on the all night show when they played country music, not just country music, because the urban cowboy was big at the time. So that was kind of I thought, well, okay. And that, that was an okay movie. And some of the songs were all right in that movie. So I figured I could do it. But when I got there, it wasn't actually that kind of country music. It was like traditional country music, like 50s and 60s country music, like the real thing, which as a 19-year-old, it was weird. And everything, I'd never played records before. Everything was on cart at CJCH. So it was all like 45 RPM records and they were scratchy and they were all like the songs were two minutes long. So working from six to midnight doing that country show was so much work. So anyway, I did that for three months, and, I, and then uh, I realized I'd made a terrible mistake in going to that radio station. Though I learned a lot there, but I, I, it was the wrong place to go. So I, I phoned Randy Duell at CJCH, and I said, who would hire me, do you think? And he said, call Terry Williams at CKLC in Kingston. So I called Terry Williams. And it's weird, because I was always using the name Doug St. Clair on the radio then. And he had just fired a guy called Ron St. Clair and needed somebody like stat. And so I gave my notice on December 23rd and started, which was shitty to do, and started in Kingston on uh, January 2nd at CKLC doing the All Night Show, just after John Lennon died. You know what really strikes me when you tell this story is just how young you are when all this is taking place. Yeah, I was young. But I mean, it's funny now, because when you get old, you realize all the guys who you thought were old when you were young, were probably younger than, than it's, it's, um, cause I remember when I worked at CJCH, I mean, I don't know how old, I think Brian Fell is probably 15 years older than me. Everybody seemed so much older and, and you just, and you felt really young. I mean, I was lucky that I got into the business when I was really young. Being really young and, and immature had its ups and downs in those days. When I got to CKLC, it was great because everybody there was a lot younger. And when I got there, the lineup at CKLC, it was uh, Greg Hunter did mornings. Robin Brent did middays. A guy called Rick Jensen did afternoons. Jim Elliott was early evenings. And the cool thing about CKLC was Jim Waters owned it. It was it belonged to Jim and his brother, Ron, and his sister, whose name I think is Sarah. But anyways, it was Alan Waters' kids who owned this radio station. So it was like a mini chum. They had just gotten rid of ops. The shifts were like three and four hours long. So it was like bizarre for a, you know, a small medium market radio station to be that privileged in what they had on the air. 
Scott Jackson did late at night, so he did 10 to 2, and then I did 2 a.m. till 6 a.m. for about six months. It was a really neat radio station. A lot of people like Jeremy Smith went through there. A lot of people went through that radio station and went on to, to do all kinds of really interesting things. How long did you spend at that station in Kingston? I spent a long time there. I, I started doing the all nights in 1981 and... Terry Williams left and they brought in Doug Pond to be the program director. And then Dave Foreman came in after Doug Pond. And then Rick Halson came in from CKEY to be the program director in 86. And then when Rick Halson left in 87, I became the program director at CKLC and programmed it till 91. I, I loved doing that. It was a really fun radio station to program. And when I was programming 100 mornings, Jane Douglas did middays. Scott O'Brien did afternoons. Mark Payne did evenings. Like a ton of people went through there. And it was really fun to program. And so right around this time is when I graduate from Acadia. And I wind up working at Shom And your programming, 980, which became 990, CKGM. It was 990 hits when I think I got there. And you were the program director. And, and you and I would pass each other in the hallway. But we never even got the chance to sit down and have any of the conversation we've had to up to this point, even though you and I are working side by side because we're so damn busy. Uh, it's funny because like David Wolf, who hired me in Halifax, gave me my first job. He had come to Halifax from being the promotion director at CKGM. And I loved CKGM. I thought CKGM was a really good top 40 radio station in the 70s. And it went through so many iterations in the 80s and after it was sold. And, and when, when Chum picked it up, it really kind of became like a light rock station. And they just like they tried all these different formats and none of them were great because they had left behind their legacy. And I think that's what has gone wrong with so many radio stations. And there's like a gazillion reasons that we all know about. But they went to 990 and became 990 hit. Susan Davies was the program director when they flipped from CKGM to um, CKIS and became not, and went to 990. And then Susan Rogers hired her to go to um, Vancouver and they needed a program director. And Jim Waters suggested me and Lee Hamilton, who was the general manager, didn't think I was experienced enough. And they brought Brad Jones in from Chum to flip it out of hits and turn it over to oldies. And so Brad was there for a couple of months and Jim kept pushing for me. And I guess Lee finally capitulated and Jim put me in direct contact with Lee, who is the general manager for me to negotiate my job in. So I came in, but because I was only program director there for a year and it was, it was weird because of the situation in, and how I wound up getting there. Cause I know that I think that that station could have been as an, because it was a good oldie station, but it could have been so much better. And there was a couple of reasons why I don't think it didn't succeed to the point that it could have. I mean, there was an uphill battle as it was because, you know, it, it's on AM and FM is really beginning to supersede AM at, the, at that time. But to your point, thank you, by the way, for mentioning the name Mark Payne. There's a, a memory that's come back because I think he was working in the building with us at the time. He did. He was doing nights when it was hits. And then they put them on middays when it became oldies. And for me, as a programmer, when I went in, that was the problem with the station was that they kept all the original hits jocks who were all really youthful. They were all young. Everybody was young. Everybody was probably under the age of 25. And in my mind, when I went in to program that station, I thought it would be great if they had a, had like, if they could get Ralph Lockwood back and if they could bring Mark Denis back to do mornings or afternoons and, and bring back a lot of these legacy jocks that people in the 70s, when CKGM was in its heyday, if they had brought some of those talents back to that station. And the other problem was the music they were using was basically Chum's Library from Toronto. And Toronto and Montreal are such different markets musically that so much of the music that was played was like just, it did not reflect the joie de vivre that Montreal had it did not reflect that city. And I think those, those were two of the big problems why that station never really kind of got to where it could have gone. And my, that was my vision in my mind for where I wanted it to go, but it, it would never came to be. No, and you're right. And, and right around, I think it was 93, 94, you had moved on. I had moved on as well. And I went to Edmonton. And, you know, I think, you know, what you're talking to is really, you know, that culture of Young Street didn't really match up with Green Avenue. Not at all. 
the Canadian content that they played on oldies was basically all stuff from the 60s. You know, it was like Bobby Vinton, and it was just, there was no Pagliero, and the station was really skewed to mid-early 60s when my feeling was if it was going to have an impact, that it needed to be more skewed late 60s to mid-70s, and then they could have like the Paglieros and Patsy Gallant. A lot of missed opportunity there. But yeah, I mean, it's true. I loved working in Montreal. Favorite market that I worked in in radio, just because of how different radio was. Because when I got work at CFQR Q92 and CIQC, the difference in, in the music libraries and the sense of the radio stations, you could tell that there was a francophone influence in the programming of those radio stations. Yeah, I think there might have also been a conversation or two about if you move too much of the music to the 1970s on CKGM, you might start to bastardize or cannibalize Shom a little bit. Yeah, which I always thought was a stupid argument because Shom was on FM. But I mean, those are all the arguments that were made to me. And it was like, the oldie station was never going to play. Babe Ruth. Yeah, it's not, they were going to they play Springsteen. They were going to play the songs that CKGM played. You know, it was a funny argument. I mean, Shom's heritage was, was interesting too, because at the time, Shom was shedding its progressive image that had done it so well and was really bringing its library down in size to, you know, less than a thousand titles, less than 700 titles. And yeah, they were really shrinking things down too and abandoning their heritage. So it was, yeah, kind of weird. But and everything's, everything's great in hindsight, right? When did you get your uh, pilot's license? When I left and was paid out when I left oldies, I took some time to learn how to fly then. It's what everybody does when they're having an existential crisis. You learn to fly. I mean, what drew you to flying? I enjoyed traveling and flying in airplanes when I traveled. And I'd always thought about it. And I had, you know, some money. And I thought, well, why not just do this? And so I, for my birthday, I went out to the flying club and plunked down the cash for flying lessons. And and I did it. And so, you know, your first, like, you're very, they always take you, they, you, you know, you go out and they, they say, well, before you sign up, we'll take you for a, like a circuit and up you go in like a Cessna 152 or 72. Anyway, they, and up you go and, and you're flying around a little plane. The instructor says, well, why don't you take the controls? And so you, you know, you take the controls and then he gives you like little tipsies and I just bank it a little bit. And he tells you how to, you know, up and forward and, you know, use the elevators and then by the time you've taken your little 15 minute flight, you're hooked. It's like, okay, how much do you need from me now so I can start on this tomorrow? And it works every time, I think, in flying schools. I mean, I got my private's pilot license and I went on to get instrument ratings and my commercial ticket so that I can instruct. And yeah, I love flying. It was great. I was going to pursue it as a career, but at the time that I got really serious about pursuing it as a career, the airline industry in Canada really started to contract. And there were jobs, but I was not interested in living in Yellowknife or Lynn Lake or something like that. So, And I also got a call from the Weather Network then and went back to my broadcast path. That brings me around 1996, where I just had these visions of Canadian airlines beginning to go out of business. And WestJet hadn't quite come along yet, but here comes the Weather Network, which was now, you're going to have to correct me because my memory is not so hot. I believe it was based in Montreal at the time, and I want to say it was a creation of telemedia. Ah, uh, you're really close. It, it was in Montreal. They were in the teleport building down at the corner of Papineau and René Levesque, right across from the Molson building, right underneath the Jacques Cartier Bridge. And that building was purposely built for the 76 Olympics. That's where all the uh, international broadcasters had their control rooms and their studios for the Montreal Olympics in 76. So it was a really cool building and a really neat location. And I started there on the eve of the last referendum was my very first shift. I'd actually got hired like three months before, but they didn't have any shifts. And so anyway, they finally, they called me. And it was a neat place to work. I mean, half the part-time staff I had when I was programming at Oldies 990 worked at the Weather Network. And ha everybody at the Weather Network had a job in radio in Montreal. None of the people on air were meteorologists, not maybe one or two. I know that at Meteo Media, there were more meteorologists on air than there were at the Weather Network. But when I think back at 96, people who were on the air, Deborah Arbeck from CGAD was on the air. Al Dubois did the Weather Network. Gary Ryan, who was a radio guy from Ottawa, was on the air. Lila Fang, who only had uh, radio and television experience. 
Les Criffenden was on the air. He was he did uh, weekend news for us on Oldies and Shome. I mean, everybody who worked on the Weather Network had a radio job in Montreal. I have some other names that just from memory come up. Uh, Tara Schwartz. Tara Schwartz, yep, radio person. Randy Renault. Randy Renault did the blues show on Shome every Saturday night. And still doing middays. When they moved to Toronto in 98, about half the on-air staff came and about half of the behind-the-scenes staff came and Randy came. But I don't know that Randy liked Toronto as much as he liked Montreal, because I think he went back in 2000. He left. But yeah, Randy, for sure. He did. And, and uh, I was there when we hired him back to show him in Montreal, and he's been there ever since. Yeah, I like Randy. He was a great guy. David Tyler is another name that came up. And, yep. You know, just in, in past conversations on this podcast, he, he's mentioned a couple of times that he worked there. And um, here's a fun name. Scott Sims. Scott Sims worked there. Scott and I became really good friends. I still talk with Scott on Twitter. I did actually just sent him a note the other day to wish him a happy new year and, and hope that this year goes better than last year went. Because he was generally, he left in, I'm um, going to say, 2002 or three. He was doing the morning show at the time, but he worked with Tara Schwartz doing late nights and they were really good together. And he got into politics and he went back to Newfoundland. And it's weird because I worked at the Weather Network from 96 till late 98 and I got and I was tired of commuting. I had a place in Montreal but I didn't get a place when they moved to Toronto and I commuted back and forth from Kingston. I've always had a house here. And so I I quit the Weather Network in September of 98 to take a job doing the weather at the local TV station here in Kingston CKWS. And Scott Sims was I don't know if he was married to but he was certainly he had a child with and I can't remember her name but she was one of the reporters at CKWS. I think they were not together at the time because he would come to Kingston every weekend to spend time with his son at the time that I was working at CKWS. Anyway, I only lasted there three months and I went back to the Weather Network. But yeah, Scott Sims. And he just, he, he had been the member of parliament for central Newfoundland until the last election. And he was always traditionally the first declared winner in federal elections from the time he first won that seat. And, this, and, and finally, after 20 years, he lost the seat in his last election, but he's doing fine. Yeah, right through until uh, until the last election, 2021, Coast of Bays was riding. But I found that to be a fascinating transition from going to the Weather Network into Parliament and, and being there through so many governments. There's some little Weather Network history for you that a lot of people don't talk about. I know. It's funny how many people, because Kevin Yard, who's the uh, member of the provincial parliament in uh, for Brampton North, did the Toronto Morning Show on the Weather Network for years, too. Marcia Ian from CTV into politics. Yeah, it's kind of weird. You know, people develop some profile in the community and people learn to trust them and elect them if they choose to run, it seems. In just a second, we're going to talk about the early days of the Weather Network, how the whole thing evolved from being like a big, giant production to, well, just camera shots on a phone. We're also going to have an honest discussion about climate change and talk about some of the worst weather events that he had to cover. By the way, Chris also has a book in production... You can find details on that at soundoffpodcast.com. The Sound Off Podcast with Matt Kundal. And when you think back to the early days of the Weather Network, you were just talking about, you know, a couple of people who would work overnight together and have, you know, some chemistry. I mean, there was a lot of airtime to fill and a lot of different ways to fill it. I mean, there was a lot of personality that got to flow and no disrespect, but I would find myself watching cable in Edmonton and I said, I'm just going to watch this, you know, for about a half hour. and you made the weather interesting. You know what it was? Because what I really liked about it, it was basically radio on television. Because if, if you go into television, there's nowhere in television other than doing play-by-play -play sports that you, they don't work from a script. And there was no script ever at the Weather Network. Never, ever, ever. There was never, I mean, they used teleprompters if, if they were, like, you know, doing, recording a story or something. But all the weather hits were off the top of your head. There's a lot of planning and everything that went into it. But back in the beginning, they also didn't have ads. When I started working there, I think Enviralet was the only ad they had. So the hits, there was three six-minute hits every half hour. And six minutes is a lot of time to talk and on a particular topic too, just the weather. So yeah, the people were a neat breed of people. And I think that that's why there were so many radio people who were filling those roles on the Weather Network at the time just because those people had the chops to do that kind of stuff. 
they could go and they could do it and they could ad lib. I know that when they moved to Toronto and I went back there, I spent a lot of time training most of the people who are on the air now. And a lot of them were really young and out of school, either out of, you know, journalism school and stuff. And so teaching them about to ad lib for three and four minutes, you forget about how it comes naturally. But if it's not what you've been doing for 10 or 12 or 14 years, it can be something that's difficult to do. There's definitely an evolution to the channel because when it first started, it was a big looking TV production. And if you wanted weather recorded, I mean, it must have been a struggle to get the weather, you know, the images into the station to put onto the television. It felt expensive. Yeah, you know, the Weather Network was owned by Lavalin, SNC Lavalin. And it's bizarre how they wound up getting the license because they got their license to have the Weather Network. It was called Weather Now when it went on the air. It went on the air in, I think, 87 or 86. It was the second wave of specialty licenses after the Much Musics and, and those one and TSN. So it was in the second wave of licenses that the CRTC gave them. And Lavalin got the license. And Lavalin, SNC, it, like, it's SNC Lavalin Engineering Company. And the reason why they got it was because they were doing a lot of work with the offshore oil industry in Atlantic Canada. And they had a team of meteorologists. And I don't I have no idea, seriously, why they, unless they had decided they would create this television network as some type of a tax write-off or why they did it. And the initial plan was, and I believe even when they initially went on the air, was to be based out of Halifax. But they wound up in Montreal, and SNC-Lavalin owned it for a couple of years, and they were in partnership with Landmark Communications in the United States, which had just started the Weather Channel in the United States. And sometime around 19, it was three years before I started, so 93, Pierre Morissette approached Lavalin, or Lavalin approached him, and he bought it. And Pierre, this is your connection to, to telemedia. Pierre Morissette was, and still is the owner, but he was the CFO at Telemedia and had left Telemedia and bought a whole chain of radio stations across Northern Ontario in Timmins and Capuscasing and Sudbury and North Bay. He bought, and Sault Ste. Marie, bought a whole, all of those radio stations and was creating his Pelmerex empire in Northern Ontario. And then he bought the Weather Network and Meteo Media, which I believe became the crown jewel in his uh, broadcast empire because he did shed off the radio stations after time. But he also had that all night network that did, uh, he had a country music network that he ran out of. It's funny because the, the offices and studios were all in Montreal for the weather network, but the head office was in an in industrial park or a, a business park in Mississauga. And it was a, a building that they looked, they looked like row houses, condominium row houses but they were all offices. And they had in the basement of the building, there used to be squash courts. And they took one of the squash courts and turned it into the studios for the country music and the oldies national radio network. And the other squash studio, they converted into a television studio. And they did a um, three-hour drop-in show in, on the weather network for Toronto specifically every morning. And then they would go back to the network feed from Montreal. And that continued. And well, thanks for clearing that up. You, you brought it around nicely and, and perfectly because we were talking about the evolution, you know, of, of the channel because it did feel a little bit expensive. Yeah, but as time went by, you don't need to send people out in the field to gather the video because then along in 2007, social media starts to show up. And, you know, 2010 onward, I mean, even I had my video put up there a couple of times when I would shoot weather, I would get a notification inside, you know, Actually, somebody at your company would slide into my DMs and say, hey, Matt, can we use this? And I say, absolutely. And, you know, here's a down tree in my swimming pool. Here's a tornado going by. But, you know, a couple of times my weather wound up on the weather network. And, man, like, here's, a, here's this big production, you know, very expensive looking TV station that immediately is one of the very first TV properties to start incorporating social media into its broadcasts. This is what is great about Pierre. I had dinner with him uh, about two months ago, and he's sharp as a tack still. He's, he's in his late 70s. He still has his fingers in the company, but Pierre didn't like to spend money, and they pioneered so many things at the Weather Network. We didn't actually start doing stuff live from the field until there was technology that allowed us to do that affordably. I mean, it costs a fortune to rent satellite trucks. First time they ever rented a satellite truck 
was when the Goderich tornado happened and, and they rented one and went down there. And that was like 2004 or something. But out of Waterloo, Ontario in 2012, an, an engineering student, he was on the hustings on the election campaign and he was traveling with reporters. And reporters, he saw how difficult it was for reporters to file their stories if they didn't have a satellite truck. They'd have to like shoot the story and then they'd have to get the tape back to the station. And he saw how difficult it was and he thought, wouldn't it be cool if there's a way that we could marry cell phone technology to television cameras? And this was before we had phones with cameras in them that we could shoot video and everything. So anyway, he came, he's, he came up with a system called a DeGero system. And it went into use in 2012. And basically, it was like a box the size of a briefcase. And you'd plug your camera into it and you would shoot and use your microphone and do all your reports. But you would also dial in the studio. And it would use a cell phone signal to send the information back as packets of information. And so basically with like a two second delay, you could be live from the field anywhere that there was a cell phone signal. So the Weather Network immediately bought a bunch of them. And all of a sudden we started being live in the field all the time. At the same time, they'd also been masterful in being pioneers with websites. And the weathernetwork.com is one of the top five visited websites for traffic in the country. I mean, the web and television became equals in generating profit for the company like 10 years ago. They were brilliant at that. And then when telephones and social media started to have the ability to shoot video and everything, they became masterful at crowdsourcing their information. I'm, it's, it's funny because I'm writing a book about my 25 years doing weather. And part of the book is how much technology has changed in all of our businesses in 25 years. Because, um, I mean, they were masterful at cultivating their audience to send them videos. And I, when, when I would do my shift on the weekend, I'd whip my phone open when I got up at two and I'd start going through all the video that had been submitted by viewers in, over the course of the past week. There was literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of video that you could scroll through and look through. And it was like the audience, and, and I think that's a neat thing about them because like a local full service radio station, the community, in their case, the community is Canada, but has this really deep connection with that particular broadcast service. And it served them really well. But it's neat the way that technology has taken us from where we were back when you started and back when I started to where we are today. That I mean, with COVID, a friend of mine, Scott Jackson, who I worked with at, at CKLC, is an owner of that Christian Life 100 station in Barrie. And he had just posted a picture on Facebook today about how lonely it was to go into the radio station because everybody's working remotely. And at the Weather Network at the head office in Oakville there, before COVID, there was on any given day, other than the weekend, 250 people working in that building. And then when COVID came, everybody was out of the building and everybody was working remotely. And when I finished working there in July, when I would go in to do my weekend shift, it was me, my producer, and the guy in master control, and the security guard. And that was it. And we were running a television network with, you know, three people in the building. It's like wild where we've come with technology. Well, you mentioned the website. The app is phenomenal as well. I mean, right on my phone, I have choices. I could, I could ask my phone to tell me the weather. I could ask the smart speaker to tell me the weather. I mean, we've completely made weather reporting on the radio rather redundant because we can get it faster on your phone. Nothing makes me cringe more than when I hear a disc jockey say, coming up next, the weather, because you can get it in six seconds on your phone. But just speaking to the Weather Network app and how great it is, is being able to just scroll open to see the radar to know if storms are going to be coming within the next half hour. I just think about all the baseball games that I've had to you know, be a team coach to. My son is a baseball umpire. He'll just pull up the app to say, hey, we got to wrap this up in a half hour. How do we want to handle this? Who, how are we going to get the innings in? Because it's fairly accurate. I mean, no, in the prairies, we're not going to be able to know exactly where the storm pops up, but you can certainly see something moving in. Yeah. Well, I remember, I mean, we had meetings about this and like eight years ago when the app went into development and, and they introduced the app and the problem was bad and with at the time. The plan was, and I remember being at these meetings talking about how would, you know, they were drawing on some of my programming knowledge about how we could make this look cool as an app. But the problem was there was not enough bandwidth to do everything they wanted to do back then, which is everything that they're doing now. And it was waiting for it to become affordable to do that. But that was their plan all along was that the app, the mobile app would be their business. And it's what it is evolving to. I mean, 
the television is becoming a long form service now that I mean, people don't go to their television to get the weather anymore. Like you said, you get it in, you, you say, Alexa, what's the weather? And you get it. It's on your phone. They saw the evolution where it was going and they've been really proactive in reacting to that. And I mean, yeah, their whole business is built on servicing that app now. I'll mention two of the bigger weather stories that I think come to mind when I think of Canadian weather. Probably the Fort Mac fires in 2016 and the ice storm of 1998 in Quebec. What other ones did I miss? No, those are those are big. I mean, there have been tornadoes, but now the, as far as impact, the Calgary hailstorm uh, a couple of years ago that caused, I think it was 2000, I'm going to go 17, but it may be 18 or maybe even 19. No, it's 2020. It cost a billion five hundred dollars. But yeah, long term emotive events, the ice storm in, in ninety eight, definitely. And but I think that as a unifying Canadian event, the Fort McMurray fire, most definitely. That was an unbelievable event. And you know, they say that there's no difference between people in Canada and other countries, and there is a difference. And I and I've known it from experience of because I've been in numerous hurricanes in the States. And I've seen how people behave. And the way people behaved in the Fort McMurray fire makes you proud to be a Canadian. It reaffirmed any doubts you had about humanity. It was simply an unbelievable event. You've seen a lot of weather, and we've heard a lot about climate change. I guess our only exposure to climate change, other than having to experience it yourself, but you know, we hear a lot of it in politics, in the news, it's this, we'll see some protests. But I mean, you work with the data, touch and feel every day with the weather. Give me your view of, of what is climate change and how should we be looking at it? I mean, it's nice that they've rebranded it as a crisis because it it's an existential crisis. I have been trying, and the Weather Network, we've been trying to find ways to cover it that is palatable to people for years. I first really got into it in 2002. I went to a couple of conferences, and in the time since then, I have interviewed David Suzuki five times, and we spent like an hour and a half with him each time. He just got he got more upset every time we sat down with him. And it, the, the last time I talked to him three years ago, he said, "I don't even know why we're doing this anymore. Having these conversations, nobody's paying attention." And he's, he was frustrated, and it's hard because the way it was at the beginning, a it's happening. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The problem in the weather business with climate change is meteorologists have said for a long time, and, and finally, the end of this story is that meteorologists are now actually saying, you can say things are attributable. But climatologists who study climate over the long term have talked about climate change for almost 50 years. Meteorologists who only talk about the short term today and tomorrow and the day after. So they're dealing like with apples and oranges. So meteorologists would always say, well, you can't say that that ice storm was because of climate change. Or you can't say that that hurricane was because of climate change because it was a singular event. For me, it all kind of became minutia after a while. It was like, come on, man. In 2018, there were like one, two, three, four, five Category 5 hurricanes in a row. It's like, seriously, like that's never happened before. Just like the past seven years have been the hottest years on record. Like last year was the hottest year, but this year was hotter than last year. And it's just like all of the evidence is overwhelming that this is taking place. And so finally, meteorologists are saying, yeah, this is happening. The problem is to make the changes that need to be made require some, some real sacrifices. And I don't think people have been willing to want to do that, though, when you do polling politically and when you poll Canadians, climate is always one or two in things that people are most concerned about. And it's just how willing are people to make the changes? And I think that so often in the past 20 years, the onus of responsibility has always been put on the individual citizens that you need to change your ways. And it's, it's not individual. Yes, we do need to change our ways. But I think that industry has to take an equal or larger responsibility in it as well. Certainly the government already has. And it's neat to see like people like Elon Musk and Tesla embracing electric vehicles. And, and so it's neat to see now large corporations like the oil and gas industry are spending tons of money. The wind farms that are owned in Texas are owned by oil companies. So it's, it's neat to see that the energy industry is understanding the shift and making it. When I worked at the Weather Network, I always worked, people invited me. They wanted to debate climate change with me, and I always declined. 
I didn't want to debate it because it, for me, there was no debate on it. And so, but I think that the people are grappling with it. And I think that more big things will happen in the coming years, but it's not a case of, but it can't be stopped. So it's a case of our adaptability. And, and, you know, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, who I've spoken for on the, you know, the rubber chicken circuit a lot, they're aware of it. And they know that it's a case of what we do to adapt to it because the kind of the genies out of the bottle, the temperatures are going to get warmer. The storms are going to get stronger. Heat waves will become greater. Cold spells will become colder. And so it's now, instead of trying to stop it, it's how do you adapt to it? How do we plan our cities? How do we plan what we do, our infrastructures, so that these are things that we can become adaptable to? I'm glad you're not entertaining any debates, by the way, because I don't know why anybody would debate the numbers and the solid data that you have. I don't know, like, who'd want to step in that ring? I mean, you got to be nuts to go up against the numbers. And, you know, even just the things I see in British Columbia right now, I see entire rivers of clouds just dumping water like I've never seen before into areas that have never taken this much water. And, you know, even if you just look at, you know, what's coming in. In Winnipeg, nobody's nobody's talking about this, by the way, because people say, hey, uh, in the summer, you have to deal with all the mosquitoes. Well, we haven't had to deal with mosquitoes for about six years now. They're gone. Again, people will cheer climate change for that, but that's an indication that something is amiss. Yeah, I mean, it's wrong. And Winnipeg is actually, when it comes to climate change, Winnipeg is actually an excellent city as an example of saying, okay, we have a problem. How do we address the problem? You know, like the floodway in Winnipeg was the result of countless floods ever since we built that city in the wrong place. But we found, we engineered ourselves a solution to that problem. And and, I mean, that's the positive. And the uptick on it, And because they always say, well, all these jobs are going to be lost if we get off of carbon base and we have to make... No, there's going to be more jobs created because we're going to have to engineer ourselves out of a lot of problems. Like you look at the construction project, the size of it in building the floodway around Winnipeg, it's what, 63 kilometers. And after the floods... In uh, 97, they widened the floodway, like they doubled its capacity. Those are huge construction and engineering projects. There's positives in the climate change when it comes to taking our big, giant human brains and applying them to a problem that we've created. There we go. I'd probably put the 1997 floods in Manitoba at number three on our list of memorable you know, weather events. And you know, I think back, I was a part of the city in 2009. and when we did have floods again, we were sandbagging, but the ditch that you're referring to, known affectionately as Duff's Ditch. Duff's Ditch. Duff's Ditch. Uh, he was the premier at the time who dug it up. Saved the city, likely, from going underwater. And Winnipeg hasn't had a catastrophic flood since, but it was not 10 years ago that the flooding was on the Assiniboine River. And it was a portage la prairie, and they had to release the water from a lot of the embankments and levees in the portage area, and it flooded, it rose the water through the inner lake district and led to widespread flooding there. And there had been widespread flooding in Brandon. So the problem still exists. It's just they haven't engineered the entire province out of it yet. Actually, uh, you were right. It was 10 years ago because that was 2011. So as as we have this conversation now in, in 2022, just at the beginning of 2022, but yeah, that you're right about the Assiniboine. We don't have, a, there's no floodway over there. And so there was all sorts of toxic water that went into all the wrong places and who knows what happens to all the agriculture at that time. Yeah, exactly. So much of it goes back to, I, I was at a United Nations conference in Montreal four years ago, and a couple of the speakers were indigenous elders. And one of them is is a a well-known Canadian architect. And he talked about how we, as Europeans who came to North America, built all of our cities in all of the wrong places because the indigenous word for Winnipeg was muddy water. And they traded there, but they wouldn't set up a settlement there because they knew it flooded. Anyway, this architect said, you know, we need to re-engineer so many of our cities. The reason why Toronto floods all the time is because it's been uncontrolled urban growth. And we've put down so much pavement and concrete. And it's the same in any large city like Winnipeg, in Edmonton, in Calgary, like all of these large cities. We pave so much, it's like a Joni Mitchell song, but there's no place for excessive runoff to go. And one of the signatures of climate change is that the climate may become drier for us, but when we do get rain, 
we get a month's worth of rain in three hours. And so we get massive runoff and we get massive floods. So it is the story in news that news isn't covering. Chris, what's going to be next for you? I'm just finishing a book. And it's neat that we talked about so many things because all of these things are kind of in the book. So my deadline's the end of January. It'll be in Simon & Schuster of publishing. It's called Weather Permitting. 25 years of ice storms, hurricanes, and extreme climate change in Canada. And it's kind of neat. You know, this hour is 22 minutes. Mark Critch talked to his brother, Mike Critch, who's the morning guy at K-Rock in St. John's. And I told him a couple months ago, I said, I'm writing this book. And he said, oh, you should call it Weather Permitting. And so anyway, when, when I submitted a whole list of titles to my publisher, they said, well, this is the title we're going to go with. It's the best one. So anyway. So it has the, the title of the book has kind of a radio connection. So there's that, and I'm exploring a couple other things I, that I'd like to do. But it's, I'm kind of, I paint, and it's kind of nice to not do anything after. Because you know what it's like when you get in radio and you're like hustling all the time. You know, you, you do your gig and you're doing remotes. And so my whole life has been really busy doing work. And so it was, it was kind of neat when I stopped working in the summer to get up and not have to do anything. It's weird, but it kind of grows on you. I have a couple of friends in radio still who've talked to me about doing maybe a radio show, which I'd be really kind of interested in doing if I could do it my way. And so, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Once a programmer, always a programmer. Yeah, I know. I know. (laughs) Chris, thanks so much for doing this and being on the Sound Off podcast and being Canada's weatherman for over 25 years. Well, thank you for having me. Pleasure. And it was great to connect again. Best thing is how neither one of us remember the 90s much. Yeah, it was a blur. Yeah, well, if, with the Expos and the Habs doing so well, who could blame us, right? The Sound Off Podcast is written and hosted by Matt Kundle. Produced by Evan Serminski. Social media by Courtney Krebsbach. Another great creation from the Sound Off Media Company. Imaging courtesy Core Image Studios. There's always more at soundoffpodcast.com.